Let's pray. God, we invite you into this place this morning. Um, God, would you pour your Holy Spirit out onto each person in here? Um, God, we ask that hearts would be changed this morning. Um, Father, if there's somebody in here that does not know you as their Savior, God, would today be the day of salvation for them? God, I pray that you would speak through me. God, would it not be my words, but yours that are heard? Um, God, we need your power in this place um, if we are to understand and to know you more. So God, we again invite you into this place this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be just a couple verses past what Ryan preached on last week. Um, I hope you got to hear that sermon. If you have not heard Ryan's sermon, I really invite you and encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, it, was the, it was the first sermon in this Advent series that we're doing that we're walking through the songs of the Christmas season. Mary's song, Zachariah's song, Song of the Angels and the Shepherds. Um, and, and what Ryan really keyed on last week was the heart that Mary had. Um, see, because when you read her song, it's called, called the Magnificat, she opens with these words, says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Like, like that's the first thing that poured out of Mary's heart. Everything about her points to God. Like it's away from herself and points straight to God. And, and the question that he asked was this. He said, how do we have that same soul's longing? Like, like how do we emulate what Mary had in her song. Now this week, I, I've got a similar question, but, but it really kind of takes it to the next step, and that's how do we take that soul's desire, the soul desire that Mary had, hopefully we have in this room as well, and how do we make it our purpose and make it our mission to spread that glory to all those around us? Like, like, so how do we do that? How do we bring more people into the glorification of God. See, because when we see something amazing, we've got to tell people about it, right? Like you see a beautiful sunrise, you see a mountain range, you see a shooting star, whatever it is that's beautiful to you, you see that and you go and tell people about it. Like you're like, man, you are not going to believe what I just saw. You're, you're flipping through pictures on your phone. You're like, this is incredible. Or even better yet, you invite them and say, hey, come see this with me. Like, come take a look because this is crazy. And it is the same exact thing with God for us. Like, but exponentially more important. Like, we look at God and we behold everything that God is and everything that God has done, all of these blessings that he has poured out on us, and it should make us say, hey, come and see this with me. Like, like come with me to the feet of Jesus. And so that's what Zechariah does here, is he's, he's beholding all of these blessings that the Lord has bestowed on him, and so he sings. And so if we fast forward just a couple verses into Luke chapter 1, we come to Zechariah's song. And in Latin, it's called the Benedictus, which literally means the blessing, like the blessing. And so this is what comes out of Zechariah's mouth, starting in verse 67. It says, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So this is Zechariah's song. 
This is what he sings. And for us to really understand like the gravity of what Zechariah is talking about, we need a little backstory on Zechariah. So he was a priest. He was one of many, many priests at the time. And what would happen is they would cast lots on any given day to see which priest it would be that would go into the temple, that would go into the holy of holy places. And when in there, the priest would make atonement for sin, he would do sacrifices, he would mediate for the people to God. Like, like that's what a priest did. And so this is Zechariah's day. He, he, the lots fell on him. That was by no accident, by the way. The Lord ordained this to happen. And so Zechariah thinks he's just going in to kind of do what they always do. But as Zechariah enters the Holy of Holies on this particular day, an angel of the Lord appears to him. Now, in and of itself, that would be terrifying. Like, you're standing in here, and all of a sudden, an angel is just standing in front of you, talking to you. I would be outside of my mind if that happened. But keep in mind, God has been silent for 400 years. 400 years, God has not spoken to his people. And from what we see in the Bible, this interaction is the first recorded speaking of God back to his people. This is the first one, and it's here, God speaking through an angel directly to Zechariah. Now that is mind-blowing, absolutely wild. You know Zechariah is not expecting an angel to speak to him on this day. And so the angel comes and he says, hey, you are going to have a son. You are going to name him John. And oh, by the way, he is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Like, that's going to be your son. Now, Zechariah doesn't believe at this point. Zechariah is kind of dumbfounded. He's like, okay, well, my wife actually can't have kids. Um, I'm also super, super old. Elizabeth is also super, super old. Like, I don't know if you knew that, Angel. We're not really of age anymore. Um, he said that there's no way this is going to happen. Now, the angel doubles down. He says, no, it's for sure going to happen. You are going to have a son. But because of Zechariah's unbelief, the angel says, you will be mute until John is born. Meaning, he's not going to speak a single word until John is born. Now, you might be wondering, like I am wondering, seems a little unfair. Because if you look at last week, Mary asked the exact same question. Mary said, how can this be? Zechariah asked, how can this be? Zechariah doesn't talk for a year. Seems a little unfair to me. But if you look at the two cases, and if you think about what Ryan spoke on last week, and it's really all about what pours out of your heart, then you kind of can start to see where the difference is in these two. Because if you look at Mary's, Mary asked the question more out of like wonder and amazement, almost like a, how can this be? Like, this is incredible. And then the next thing she says is, let it be. As you say it is, so it will be. Where Zechariah comes in, more out of disbelief and distrust and more of a, man, how can this be? Like, like there's no way it's going to happen. And so because of the heart that Zechariah has here, this, this disbelieving heart, he's mute. He finds himself not being able to speak for almost a year. Now fast forward nine to ten months and we come to the day that John is to be born. Now, on the eighth day after a baby boy was born, they would have a ceremony. That is when they would circumcise the child, and that's also where they would give the child the name. So, here everybody's gathered around, they're pumped, they're excited, and they look at Zechariah, and they said, congratulations, little boy. And they look at Elizabeth, and Elizabeth said, his name is John. Now, in the custom back then, this would have been a no-no. Like, every firstborn son was a junior of his father. So Elizabeth says, hey, his name is John. Every head turns to Zechariah. He's like, well, are you the dad? Like, because your name's not John, Zechariah. Like, what's going on here? Um, Zechariah then confirms by writing down, he said, no, his name is John. And at that time, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loose and he could speak again. And when he began speaking, the first recorded words out of his mouth were praise and songs of jubilation to God. And I think it's wild, because imagine everything that Zechariah would have to talk about. Like, he hasn't talked for nine or ten months. 
And I would have so many things I would want to say. I talk a whole lot, so I would be telling people all kind of unnecessary facts of like what happened in my life. Like this is absolutely wild. But Zechariah doesn't do that. What Zechariah does is he says, look at God. Like see God. I want you to look at the goodness of God. And it makes me wonder if I was in his shoes, what would actually be the first thing out of my mouth? Because if you want to know what's really important in your life, like what you actually hold value in, look at what you talk about most. Like look at what you spend your most time discussing. Like maybe for you it's local politics, like, like school board stuff, or maybe it's national politics, or it could be high school football, which we've got a lot to celebrate in here right now. P&G just went and took the state championship. That is super fun. Or maybe it's the juicy gossip right now of if Trav and Tay are ever going to get married. They're an adorable couple. Um, don't get me wrong, these are fun things. I, I want Travis, and Kel- Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift to be together forever. I think they're incredible, but we need to take a deep look. What's, what's the priority that we're talking about here? Like, like, do those things take priority over what we should be talking about? Like, when's the last time that you really took an in-depth look at what Jesus is doing in your life? And when's the last time that you really told somebody about him? Like, especially right now at the time of Christmas, like Jesus is being born. Like, how much are you talking about him? And if I'm honest and if I confess myself, there's plenty of times that I have conversations and it revolves around sports or work or, or any myriad of things. And I look back at the conversation and say, man, I didn't even bring Jesus into the conversation. Like he wasn't even hardly present in that conversation. So it's refreshing to look at these songs because it's like, man, their priorities were right. The first things pouring out of their heart was joy and satisfaction in God. And my hope would be as we walk through these songs in this Advent series that we would take these as, as an example, like that we would want to be like them, that we would want this to be our heart as well. And so if you want to magnify God, and if you want to tell others about him, one of the best ways of doing that is by looking at what is God doing in your life. Like, take a look. What is he doing in your life? Because when you see that, you've got to tell people about it. Like, when you actually see it, you're going to want to tell people about it. And that's why Zachariah sings this song. Because he is seeing some incredible blessings, and he's like, I've got to tell people about it. And so what we're going to do this morning is Zechariah highlights three specific blessings that he wants each of us in this room to see this morning. And first, Zechariah comes to the blessing of redemption. He does this, this blessing of redemption, because his life is a perfect example of it. See, remember, Zechariah was a priest. He was a faithful man. It actually says that he was blameless. doesn't mean sinless. It means that he was a devout follower. So he loved the Lord. Like he gave his life to telling people about the Lord, but in his fear and in his worry, he doubted God. He doubted the goodness of God. Now this happens to all of us. Like like we don't need to get on our high horse here of like, well, how in the world could Zechariah have ever doubted? Like we do this day in and day out, like where we take our eyes off of the goodness of God because the fear and the worry of this world just blinds us to what the Lord is actually doing and how much power he actually has in our life. So for whatever reason, we do this, Zechariah does this, even though he's a devout follower, he doubted Jesus, and he doesn't believe what he is being told. Because of this, his gift is taken away. Now I want you to remember, his gift was telling people verbally about God. Like that's what he did, that was his job. And so that, one of the most precious things to Zechariah, was taken from him. It was pulled away from him and so for a year he sits in silence and he sits under this weight of his sin and you know that this was heavy on him like you know that he was just longing to tell people about God but he couldn't and you know there were times that he's sitting there he's like man maybe maybe I won't ever speak again like like maybe it actually won't happen like like I don't really know and so he's sitting there but praise God he is one of redemption like God is one of redemption and so he pours his blessings out on Zechariah he said yes you distrusted me you disbelieved me but I'm not going to hold you against that forever 
He said, I'm going to redeem your gift, and I'm going to give you back your voice. And so Zechariah, he gets his voice back, and he turns around, and he starts telling people about God again. He said, look what God has done. He said, don't look at me. Like, like my voice is nothing special. He said, look what God has done. And he desires to do that for us today. Like, this wasn't a gift for thousands of years ago. God is doing that today. Now, now maybe it's not going to look as obvious or dramatic as all of a sudden not being able to speak, then all of a sudden being able to speak again. Like, that's a pretty obvious one. But maybe it's a sickness in your life that has been healed. Maybe it's a, a job that was lost, and there's worry, and there's fear, and then he restores or gives a new job. Could be a, a family just absolutely broken and destroyed by disunity and the Lord redeems and restores those family relations. All of these is God restoring and redeeming little bits and little pieces of this fallen world. And so Zechariah says, don't miss what God did in my life. Like, don't miss. This is re really, really cool. But then he shares. He says, there's a redemption that's even more important than this. He said, there's a redemption way more important than this bodily health. And so he begins in verse 68, and he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. See, the redemption that is most important to Zechariah, the redemption that should be most important to us, is the redemption of our lives from the pits of hell. Like that is the redemption that we desperately need. We were dead and now we are alive. As promised, God worked through the line of David, fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, all confirming who Jesus is. And because Jesus is who he says he is, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7 is true. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So my question to you this morning is, which of those versions of redemption is more important to you? Is it, is it a bodily redemption? Is it a healing of, of your body? Is it restoration of finances or relationships? Or is the eternal redemption in which we are made secure through Christ, is that most important to you? See, if your priority lies in the first one, you will be disappointed. Because there is no level of bodily blessing, a physical blessing that will ever satisfy you outside of the salvation of God. And if that's you this morning, and there's more value placed in that, I have good news for you. God is a God of redemption. He can redeem that as well. That messed up priority he can take that and turn it around to where there will never be anything more important than your relationship with the Father in heaven. He can do that. I mean, thank goodness our God isn't a God of three strikes and you're out. Like, I'd be long gone. He's not even a God of a thousand strikes and you're out. I also would be long gone. Every single one of us would. But he's a God of redemption and grace. And he does a work in our brokenness that only he can See, the deepest need that every single person on this earth has is a Savior, and we have that Savior. We have that Savior to offer. And so Zechariah says there's this blessing of redemption that God pours out, and then he backs it up with the second one, and it's the reason that we can trust in the blessing of redemption in the first place, and it is this blessing of faithfulness. See, we've heard day in and day out that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? We, we've all heard that, like he is unchanging, and that is incredibly good news. See, because if God was one who just changed his mind all the time, 
this redemption that he offers to us, this grace that he so freely pours out on us, just as quickly he could grab it and take it right back. Just that easily. He could remove that from us. And it's a hard concept for us to understand faithfulness because as humans, we're not faithful. Like we are wishy-washy people. Like maybe in our promises, we forget what we said. We're like, well, I don't think that's actually how I said it. Or maybe we're just straight up dishonest and we're like, no, I know that's exactly how I said it, but I don't really feel like standing behind that anymore, so I'm not going to. Or maybe we just give promises that we don't actually even have the power to fulfill. Like it's just out of our hands and we're like, yeah, absolutely, I will do this. I promise I'm going to do it. No doubt about it. Even though in our heads we're like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. Not a chance. And so what happens is when we do this, we see so many things just slip through our hands. We see so many things change in our lives because we trusted in ourselves. And so Zechariah knows, hey, this is imperative that I drive this point home. He said, I need you to see that God is a one who pours out blessings of redemption and he is a God who pours out his blessings of faithfulness as well. And so in a matter of just four verses, Zechariah paints the picture in four ways about the faithfulness of God. Starting in verse 70, he says, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. That's number one, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers. That's number two, and to remember his holy covenant. That's number three, and the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. That's number four. So first, he talks about the prophets of of old. He said, these guys have been talking about it for years. He said, for hundreds of years, these prophets have been saying, what's going to happen? And many of the people that that Zechariah would be speaking to right now are priests, so they know these promises that have been given to the prophets. They know what Zechariah is talking about. So in essence, Zechariah is looking at each one of them, and he says, At long last, God is fulfilling his promises. What all these guys have been telling us for hundreds of years, it's coming true now. Then he mentions God has promised his mercy. Like this is beautiful. He brings God directly into the picture. He said it's not just a bunch of old prophets that maybe you could misconstrue what they said. No, this is God himself putting his stamp of mercy to us. He said God promised this. This is something that he will directly do himself. And then, oh, by the way, third, God remembers these promises as well. He's not like us. He doesn't promise things and not come through. He doesn't promise things and forget what he said. No, God remembers exactly what he said. And when God said that he will do it, it means that he will do it. And then finally, Zechariah brings up Abraham. He brings in the big dog. Like, Abraham is the forefather of all forefathers to these priests. Abraham is the one that all of this started with. Like, right, you remember the covenant that he made with Abraham, that I will multiply your family, you will have more descendants than the grains of sand and the stars in the sky. He looks at Abraham and he says, hey, by the way, the Messiah is going to come through your lineage. Like, like it's going to be a descendant of yours. Zechariah said, hey, that covenant that you know, like, They would have remembered that covenant. He said, God's getting ready to grant it. God is getting ready to bring that covenant into life, and it is here. And church, these promises stand today. Like today, we stand under these promises because we are what's called the people of his promise. In verses 74 and 75, says that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. We are the people that he has promised this to. Each and every one of us sitting in this room is who he looked at and said, I'm going to deliver you from the hand of your enemy. He said, I am going to save you and you will be with me all of your days. Like that is us. We are the people of his promise and that is absolutely incredible and that is only true because God is faithful and he will come through and redeem his people and this is what we need right like this is what people need this is one of the biggest needs of the world is something secure to hold on to 
Because everything in our life, when you look, or look around, looks like it's fleeting and crumbling around us. Everything changes. Day in and day out, it seems like we're living in this different world. Work could be completely different than it was the day before. Like, attitudes could be different from the day before, but God is not. Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. God is the only sure and secure thing that we actually have in this world, and so we need to hold on to that. And if God is redeeming a people, if he's pouring his blessings of redemption, and he is faithful to forgive and fulfill his promises, then church, we have work to do. Like, we've got stuff to do. Because the third blessing that Zechariah talks about is this blessing of purpose. See, it's important because we all want to belong to something. Like, we all want to have something that gives us pride, that makes us feel important, that we feel like we're in this together with people And Zechariah is now pumped right now because he's holding his newborn son, realizing his son's purpose. He's looking at him, and he is this just proud dad. He's like, this is unbelievable. I know what my son is meant to do. Now, I was also a pretty proud dad the other day myself. See, we were sitting at home all together, me, Corey, Lucy, and Marley. And my daughter Marley did something that just... I mean, absolutely just blew me away. I mean, it was, it was shocking, awe-inspiring, like no kid in the history of the world has ever done this kind of thing. You're not going to believe it, but I, I raised my hand to her, and, and I kind of did this little wave, just, just this tiny little wave, and hold on to your seats. She picked her hand up, and she like kind of closed it and then opened it again. It was unbelievable. It's the craziest thing I have ever seen in my life. And so I'm now this crazy dad running around telling people about this magnificent feat of athleticism. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Like, and then I'm inviting people over. I'm like, you have to come see this. Wave at my kid. Like, like please, just, just wave at her. You're not going to believe she does it back. Like, it's unbelievable. So I'm this wild dad. And so I can only imagine how Zachariah feels standing here. Because he is holding his newborn son. Pride is welling up in him as he looks in John's face. But instead of sitting there and going to tell everybody how good John's going to be, how incredible John is going to be, the first words are, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Blessed be God. Not John. Blessed be God. And it was because of this heart that Zechariah now has. See, he has moved from that distrust nine to ten months ago to a heart of just pure joy and satisfaction in God. And it's because of this that the pride that he now has in his son is an honest and a beautiful joy that he can partake in. Because remember, it's it's Zachariah's job to tell people about God. He's a priest. And now he's looking into the eyes of John. And he's holding him. Tears are running down his cheek. And he gets to tell his son and declare over his life that, John, your purpose is the same as Zachariah's. He says, you have the same purpose purpose is me but yours is much more profound and intimate with our God because you are going to be the prophet of the most high God he declares that over his son's life see as he told people about God now John gets to tell people that God has come to earth like this this far off God that Zechariah talked about John says no that God has come near he is coming and he is here now Zechariah makes one thing very very clear crystal clear he says John you are not the main event you are not the primary purpose here pick up in verse 76 just just hear these words from Zechariah over his son and you child will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. John's purpose is to be second in importance. 
He's not number one. Yes, he's going to come before Jesus, but the only reason he's coming before Jesus is to make the Messiah's entrance as big and as important as he possibly can. Now again, don't forget the context that these words are set in. These are the, these are the first words that Zechariah has spoken in almost a year. The first ones. And so what was most important to Zechariah to talk about was Jesus and that his son gets to tell people about Jesus. That's what Zechariah had to say. He's running around like I was when Marley waved, telling people, look, look, this is my boy. He gets to be the one to tell people about Jesus. Like, he gets to be the one to tell about the one. Like, that's my boy. He gets to tell people about the Messiah, the one that God promised to Abraham ages ago. John has the most special purpose in the world. It is to make way for the Messiah. Now, what I don't want you to miss, church, that's our mission too. That is our purpose as well. You have been given the same blessing of purpose as John was given. See, John's mission was to go before Jesus and say, hey, he's coming. He's on his way. He's, he's right behind me. And this is a brutal job. God's been silent for 400 years, and now you have a guy saying, hey, not only is God speaking again, but God's here. You know, everybody's looking at him like, dude, I, I don't know if you know what you're talking about. Like, it, he hasn't been talking for a long time, so don't, don't act like all of a sudden you have all the answers. But that was John's mission. Our mission is to say, Jesus has come. Jesus was here. Jesus bought our redemption. He bought our salvation. He bought our place in heaven. And we now get to tell people that he's coming back. Like, Jesus will return that is our purpose in life, is to tell people about Jesus. It's not what job you have. It's not your hobbies. It's not your family. It's none of those things. Your purpose is to be a front runner for Jesus' sacrifice, a champion for his return. And you tell people as much as you can that he's coming. See, Jesus has given us jobs and neighbors and families to spread the gospel. He said, these are great things, use them to tell people about Jesus. See, if we go to work and come back without having a conversation about Jesus, or maybe the deepest conversation you've ever had with your neighbor is, hey, can I get a cup of sugar? I'm making some cookies. Like, man, you are missing out on your soul's deepest purpose and desire. Step into that purpose today. So as we close, I want to return to that question at the beginning. And the question was, how do we take this soul's desire to magnify God? And how do we transfer it into our purpose and mission to share the glory with everybody around? One practical application, just one, and I'm going to be done. And that's meditate on the blessings of God. Meditate on them. What is it that God is doing in your life today? Actually, think about it. Unfortunately, our answer almost every single time is either nothing or I'm not sure. That's what we answer when we're asked, hey, what's the Lord been doing in your life? But surely God is active in our life. So why aren't we looking? Why aren't we seeing the lavish blessings that God is pouring out on us? If we would just slow down and look around, man, we would be blown away of what he's actually doing. And we would then have to tell people. Think of all the miracles in the Bible. Every single time Jesus did something, the people surrounding could not get to friends and family fast enough to tell them. Like, imagine if you were there the day that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you think you're just going to be like, well, that was kind of cool, and then at the end of the day be like, man, what was it that God did today? No. For weeks and months, you're going to be like, this was wild. This guy was dead, and now he's standing right here, and you're going to tell everybody you can. People walking past on the street, they were like, bro, this guy is alive now. He was dead. They are telling everybody, and we have that same thing today. God is doing miracles in our life every single day. The fact that we don't tell people about them doesn't mean that they don't exist. It means that we're not looking for them. It means we're not seeing them. So I've got a challenge for you this morning. I've got homework, if you will. I know you didn't come to Sunday church to get homework, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I want you to write down one thing a day. Just one thing. It can be a very small thing. It can be a big thing, whatever. But what is it that you see God doing in your life today? 
And every single day, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend this to the end of 2023. It's like 15 days. It's nothing crazy. Write down one thing a day. And then at the end of each week, I want you to meet with somebody. And I want you to share that list with somebody. Tell somebody what God is doing in your life. You will be absolutely amazed when you look back and you see, oh my goodness, God did this, and God did this, and God did this, and God did this, and this, and this, and this. And then I guarantee you, however long that list is, God has done exponentially more things in your life. Make a point to look for him. Make it a point to see what he's doing. Make it a point to look for these blessings. Now, maybe this morning you're in here and you've never put your faith in Jesus. These blessings are for you as well. God has extended these blessings to you. I mean, what a special time in a season to take this. Like, like we're sitting here at Christmas time as Jesus was born of a virgin. And he goes on to live a life that we could not live. A life required to be in the presence of God. He then died a death that was owed to us. Because our sins separated us from that God. The Bible said he did this to replace our heavy burden with his light and easy one. He took our place of judgment. He took the wrath due to us. And Jesus then rose from the grave, conquering hell and death, and has given us the way to eternal life. So maybe you're in here this morning, you're like, I've never put my faith in Jesus, but I don't know how. Like, like that sounds great, and I want to, but I don't know how. Romans 10, 9 and 11 shows how simple and easy this actually is. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture said, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That's for you this morning. He said, just reach out and take it. He said, I have done the work. I have done the saving. You just have to accept it. He will redeem your soul. He will give you what you need. He will be faithful to you, and he will be with you every step of the way. And then as you step into this blessed, glorious purpose that he has given you, he will be smiling down on you every single step of the way. Let's pray. Father God, we need you this morning. God, we, we desire your salvation. God, we, we want to know you. God, we need help accepting it. God, we need you to change our hearts God, we just want you more than anything, more than we want bodily healing, more than we want any physical blessing, God. We want you and the re redemption that you have to offer. So God, would you do that work in us this morning? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Yeah.